Hi everyone, I'm Nathan Broman, and today I'm going to show you my remotely operated vehicle, or ROV submarine. This is a good project to do to get into the DIY technology field. It's very safe, low risk, it's made out of cheap common materials, there are no microcontrollers or programming or anything like that on it. There will be some tool handling skills and soldering skills involved. And there are a lot of applications for this project. You could use it for a science project, a school club, or maybe a utility purpose like inspecting the bottom of a boat, or maybe some research purposes. Or if you're just like me and you're curious about what's at the bottom of the lake, you can use it for recreational purposes. Before you start though, I do recommend having some experience in the DIY technology field. I recommend having taken physics class and shop class at school, or having someone who knows what they are doing to help you. The submarine is controlled remotely by an operator on the surface. It's connected to the operator and the power supply by a 100 foot tether, which wraps around the top of the vehicle for easy storage and transport. The submarine can move forwards, backwards, turn left and turn right, and move up and down. It cannot move side to side, except a few designs on the internet do allow for that. A camera on the front of the vehicle in a small pod streams live video back to the surface. However, it does not provide recording capabilities. Two light pods containing LEDs on either side provide light in the dark or the deep water. A control box on the back of the vehicle houses relays, which are used to turn the motors on and off. The frame of the vehicle is made from PVC pipe. I use 3 quarter inch pipe. My frame is based on the Seafox design, however you can assemble your PVC pipe however you want. Two tubes on the top of the vehicle provide buoyancy to keep the top upright. These tubes are filled with air and they're sealed so that water can't get in. But a submarine needs to be heavy so that it will sink, so two tubes on the bottom of the vehicle are filled with weight to make it sink and keep the bottom down, therefore also keeping it right side up. The trick is to make sure the submarine is neutrally buoyant, which means it will neither float nor sink. If you can't get it exactly right, it's better to be a little bit positively buoyant than negatively buoyant. That way it will float to the surface if there's a problem. The end caps can be taken off the skids on the bottom, and then when I remove that, you can see I've been using a bunch of these little pebbles. I think these are like for aquariums or something, but I've been using these for weight. If you need to make the submarine heavier, you can just add a few more of these, or lighter, you can remove some. You'll also notice that I've drilled holes in the skids to allow water to leak in, because these are not meant to be watertight the way these are. The PVC pipe frame that provides the structure of the submarine is what's called a wet frame, which means that it's not meant to be waterproof. I've drilled small holes in it to allow air bubbles to escape so that they won't affect the buoyancy of the submarine. The motors are made from electric bilge pumps. I use the Seaflow brand, which I believe is a cheaper knockoff of the Ruol brand. I modified the bilge pumps to work as thrusters by cutting the housing off of them. It used to fit on like that. I'll post a link in the comments section to the website Homebuilt ROVs where you can find instructions on how to modify a bilge pump to make a thruster. I then zip tied the motors to the frame and then mounted small model airplane propellers on them which I cut to size. Be sure to balance your props though. There are three motors on the submarine total, one on each side and one in the middle for vertical movements which I glued in with epoxy. For lights, I used super bright LEDs from SparkFun Electronics. For resistance, I'm using two 100 ohm resistors connected in parallel, which makes 50 ohms total. Never hook up an LED to a battery without resistance, or you will burn it out. You can also see in there that it's mounted on a piece of PVC pipe, which I actually use heat to bend into a shape that can hold the LED. I made a waterproof housing for the LEDs out of PVC unions and then strapped it to the frame with hose clamps. I'll post the link to the instructions to build the housings in the description of the video. The light pods can also be turned left and right and up and down 
to aim them at where the camera's looking. The wires from the LEDs and the wires from the motors have been zip tied to the frame and then connected into the control box, which has been waterproofed by filling it with wax. Connected to the other side of the control box is a cable of speaker wire, which provides power to the submarine, and an ethernet cable, which contains eight smaller wires, which switch the relays to turn the motors and lights on and off. This is my control box before I put the wax in. You can see one of the relays right here, and then this is the main power cable that delivers current to the motors. This is the ethernet cable with all the small signal wires for switching the relays. I put a zip tie here to take some of the stress off the cable and the solder joints. I used thick wire for delivering current to the motors. I actually cut some of this off the motor cables because they were longer than they needed to be. Once again, there are no microcontrollers in here. It's all soldering, no programming or anything. The lights, I actually did not use a relay. I just hooked them directly to one of the wires from the ethernet cable. They're over here. And then that's enough current to run the LEDs. They don't draw as much as the motors. Now I'm melting the wax to fill the control box with. I highly recommend using a double boiler like you see here to keep the wax from catching fire. The water can't get above 100 degrees Celsius, so therefore the wax can't either. This is the control box just after I poured the wax in. You can see right there where the tether goes in that I use hot glue to seal it. And again over here so that the wax doesn't leak out. I also put the screws in right there and on the four corners so that the wax doesn't fill the screw holes and make that hard to put in. The wax should cover all the wires and I also poured all the wax in at once instead of melting some and pouring it in and then melting some more and pouring it in because that allows the layers to solidify and allows cracks between them which could let water in. So now I just wait for this to cool. So now that the wax has cooled I took a little tool and then just dug out around the edges to make room for the lid and also a bit around the screw holes. So now we're going to put the lid on and then bolt that down and that finishes up the control box. I'll post a link to the wiring diagram for the relays in the description below. The camera is mounted in a waterproof housing similar to the ones used to house the LEDs. I'm using a small CMOS camera from SparkFun Electronics. It has an RCA output, but no recording capabilities. This is actually the second camera I got from SparkFun. The first one I had reliability issues with, and it eventually broke. I'm not sure if I got a defective product, or if I hooked it up wrong, but I would recommend making sure you can claim the warranty and read all the instructions, just in case. Just a little note about cameras. This will be the most expensive and probably the most troubling part of the ROV. I've had cameras burn out on me, I've had wires in the tether break, cold solder joints break, this, you name it. I went with the more DIY tech route and I bought a camera that involved a little bit of soldering. But if you're a beginner or you don't have access to someone who has some more experience, then I'd recommend you buy a more plug-and-play solution. Maybe something that's more suited to the job, like a camera that already has a 100-foot tether attached to it, or however long you want. Or even a waterproof camera, like a fishing camera, would be good. But that would also be more expensive. If you're going to be using a camera, I suggest that you do your research, look online, Maybe look on the forums of homebuiltrovs.com and see what other people are doing. And just make sure you know what you're doing before you start. I used a tube strap to mount the camera housing to the frame so that I can tilt the camera up and down depending on where I want to look. The cable for the camera comes out of the back of the housing. I'll post a link in the description to instructions on how to waterproof wire holes in your PVC pipe. I'm using another ethernet cable for the camera. I would recommend using coaxial cable. 
but I couldn't find a cable long enough to reach the surface. One thing I will say about the camera is that it must have its own power supply. If the camera is connected to the same power supply as the motors, then the motors will eat all the current and the screen will go black whenever you drive. The end caps of the waterproof housing are screwed on and water can still leak in through the threads. So to fix that problem, I took some cotton string like this and then I peeled it apart to get smaller pieces and then I fit these into the threads and wrapped them around. And once I had the string wrapped around in the threads, I took some plumber's tape and then wrapped that around to hold it in place and that creates an effective seal. Coming out of the back of the submarine is the tether which goes back to the surface and is a hundred feet long. The tether is made up of the speaker wire which provides power to the submarine, the ethernet cable which provides command and control by switching the relays, and the cable to the camera. I zip tied all the wires in the tether together and then I also zip-tied little chunks of foam pool noodles to the tether as well to provide buoyancy. Pieces of foam on the tether closer to the operator on the surface are larger to make the tether float and keep it out of the rocks and weeds on the bottom, while pieces closer to the submarine are smaller to provide less buoyancy, which allows the submarine to dive more easily. Back on the surface, I have a remote control to drive the submarine. I used two switches from Radio Shack to turn on and off the port and starboard motors. I'm using double throw switches, which means that they can turn two things on or off, in this case, forward and reverse of the motors. On the top, I have two push buttons for controlling up and down, as well as another switch to turn the lights on and off. When I push both switches forward, the submarine drives forward, and when I pull them back, it drives backwards. To steer, I reverse the switch on the side I want to turn to. This is the inside of the remote control. So you can see where the ethernet cable comes into the housing and then splits into several smaller cables, each of which is wired to one of the switches. The red wires are connected to the power cable and to the switches to provide power along the ethernet cable for switching the relays. Coming out the bottom is this cable, which hooks up to the battery. On the other end of the cable I just showed you are two wires, which I coated red and black, so I know which one's positive and negative. I then connect the wires to a jump starter, which I use for a battery. I just clip them in right in there. Now make sure you stay safe around jump starters. You never want to actually touch these two together because that could be really bad. Just a little safety note about electricity and water. I always know what voltage you're working with and keep it low. The voltage coming out of my battery is 12 volts, which is pretty harmless. But as the voltage increases, then there's more current and then there's more danger. The stuff that comes out of wall outlets is 120 volts, so make sure you stay away from that, especially around water. I soldered the ethernet cable coming from the camera to an RCA cable. I used to have some heat shrink tubing around that joint, but I had to take it off for some maintenance. I'll put it back on soon. So on the other side of the RCA cable is this plug, which I then plug into the input of a small DVD player and then watch the live feed from the camera. Both the camera and the small DVD player can then be plugged into the small 12 volt sockets on my jump starter. Here's some test footage of the ROV in action. As you can see, it's not very fast, even when I speed up the video a little bit. That's because the motors are only receiving a fraction of the power that's available to them because the power dissipates along the length of the tether. To compensate for this, you can make the speaker wire that delivers power to the ROV thicker, or you can make the tether shorter. You could even try onboard batteries, but then you'd have to waterproof those. Here are a few pictures from the underwater camera. Ooh, it's a fish. I hope you enjoyed the video. Good luck building your own ROV submarine.